So this intersection of how are we using technology, how is technology and this change helping with this climate change agenda? What have you observed? Right. Remote sensing by definition is this idea that uh, you can say something about uh, an object for which you can't touch. So it, uh, it's the same thing as you know, our eyes. We can, in, we can integrate all this information across our field of view and uh, fill in gaps where traditionally with forestry they have plots every so many kilometers and uh, those plots are labor intensive, um, they cost a lot of money and it's not easy to redo them repeatedly but when you have this image that just goes across the entire landscape and then you can repeatedly t image it, you know, you get this, uh, this information on how the land is changing and we are, we are able to track uh, deforestation rates, what, what land use has replaced the forest. I mean, we, we could track almost anything on the land surface, urbanization, inundation, agriculture, forest. And so it's this fantastic tool that uh, feeds into a big part of the climate change, which is the land use component. Okay, so you talked about some of the opportunities of this technology. What are some of its limitations today? Things sure, sure. I, I think one of the big things with remote sensing is to not overstate capabilities, to not say that it can do everything that you know a user might want or expect. We we have to meet somewhere in the middle because when we do remote sensing, we can't do uh, we can't see biomass directly. It is a highly modeled variable. Um, you know we don't see uh, floristic associations species very easily. So there's a lot of things uh, that we can't do, and that doesn't mean it's not useful. It just means that uh, either we can use what we can do to solve the same problem, just you know understand what it means and, and use it appropriately, or that we can integrate it with data. And how, um, how has this technology been, you know, entered into policy making at this COP22? Um, you know, has this ever been brought up for a policy, uh, in terms of the policy arena? Are they being fully utilized to a potential to, to maybe meet requirements and um, oh, NDCs? I think the biggest trick from a policy standpoint is that when this whole thing started, we talked about red plus and all this stuff, policy was a bit ahead of the science and the methods. What I mean by that is northern countries, the U.S., whatever, they don't do annual forest change mapping. No country does that. And, and, and at the same time, all the north is trying to port capacity to the south. What, what capacity are you porting? Because we've never done it, right? So there was this mismatch, I think, in the aspirations of policy. And, and we're playing catch-up now. And I think, I think we do have... I think we do have the methods that could be operationalized to support policy. Uh, we need to get them into the, into the hands of the people who are responsible for um, each of the national reports. And uh, yeah, I think, I think we're, we're, we're ready. What brought you, you know, you, you came from the U.S., what brought you to the Global Landscapes Forum? Why were you interested or motivated to be a part of this? I like it because it's got a very diverse uh, user base. So you're talking about the technical practitioners, you're talking about the governments, you're talking about the civil society. Landscape is an integrating concept. And uh, even, even with the satellite, you know, you, you don't look at a single pixel. That would make no sense to you. You wouldn't even look at a forest patch. You need to back up and it only makes sense when you look at this landscape scale. In the landscape scale, all these parties are interested in it. And I think so you have this, this nice uh, multi-stakeholder framework. So it makes a lot of sense. And